Hello, in this series on an approach to symptoms, I'm discussing unintentional weight loss. First, how much weight does a person need to lose before it becomes a red flag for the possibility of serious undiagnosed pathology? There is no consensus on this, but common ranges given for clinically significant weight loss are loss of greater than or equal to 5-10% to of a person's weight over the preceding 6-12 to 12 months. But not all unintentional weight loss should generate the same level of concern. The probability of uncovering an identifiable cause requiring treatment increases with the quantity and with the speed of loss. I'm going to come back to that in a few minutes. One issue that comes up often when evaluating a patient who has experienced weight loss is that the patient reports that they were trying to lose weight. So how does one decide if what's observed is within the range of what a person could accomplish intentionally? In my opinion, in the absence of clear objective lifestyle modifications, it is more prudent to assume a person's clinically significant loss is unintentional until proven otherwise. What do I mean by that? Well, imagine a previously obese patient proudly reporting to you that their 10% loss over the preceding six months is because they've been doing 30 minutes of cardio three times a week, have eliminated all sugary beverages from their diet, and have stopped ordering takeout after completing a course on healthy cooking. That seems like a reasonable plan to have achieved that degree of loss, and in the absence of symptoms, it warrants you to commend them and not initiate a diagnostic workup. But in contrast, imagine a different patient who did not spontaneously report any weight loss, but when you ask them about a 10% loss that you observe from looking at their weight in clinic, they reply something like, yeah, I've been trying to cut back a bit without indicating that they had any specific plan to achieve it. That's a person that I would be worried about. Another consideration is that many patients cannot provide an accurate estimate of the degree of weight loss, so always confirm the severity of loss with the medical record if possible. I've had patients report to me that they've lost 40 pounds when objective measurements at the clinic record only a 5 pound loss, and I've had patients with objectively documented 20 to 30 pound losses who themselves deny any weight loss at all. A term that often gets mentioned in the context of unintentional weight loss, is cachexia. Cachexia is not precisely a synonym for weight loss, but rather it's a syndrome of weight loss that's accompanied by loss of muscle mass, fatigue, generalized weakness, and abnormal labs, such as anemia, low albumin, and increased inflammatory markers. Cachexia can occur simultaneously with fluid retention, which can then obscure the weight loss. For example, a patient with advanced heart failure can be simultaneously cachectic while actually gaining weight since the weight gain is all fluid. The etiologies of unintentional weight loss, they are numerous and diverse. Unfortunately, the most common category is also the most concerning, malignancy. One way in which malignancy can cause weight loss is through direct effect of the tumor. Anecdotally, this seems most common with GI malignancies, particularly esophageal, gastric, and pancreatic, lung cancers, and lymphoma. Weight loss and malignancy can be also from a treatment effect, such as nausea and anorexia related to chemotherapy, or long-term complications like chronic radiation enteritis. Another category of etiologies is non-malignant GI illness. Here we find celiac disease and chronic pancreatitis, inflammatory bowel disease, and chronic mesenteric ischemia in which abdominal pain is triggered by eating leading the patient to be progressively conditioned over weeks to months to eat smaller and smaller amounts. Weight loss can be from psychiatric disease, most typically depression and eating disorders. Any kind of chronic infection can cause weight loss as well, but it's most often described with HIV and AIDS, as well as with tuberculosis. The three classic endocrine diseases which lead to weight loss are uncontrolled diabetes, hyperthyroidism, and chronic adrenal insufficiency. There are many neurologic causes of weight loss, which can either be from decreased appetite, difficulty in accessing and preparing food, or a dysfunction of the swallowing mechanism. 
Common neurodiseases here are dementia, stroke, and Parkinson's disease. And finally, we can consider an other category. For example, something called food insecurity, which is when a person has difficulty obtaining food. While poverty can play a role with food insecurity, it's not the only contributing factor. The combination of limited mobility and social isolation can also be very significant. Several chronic illnesses, which would seem to have no obvious mechanism by which they would necessarily lead to weight loss, nevertheless are classically associated with it, along with cachexia. This includes cachexia associated with advanced heart failure, known as cardiac cachexia, and that associated with COPD, known as pulmonary cachexia. Many medications are associated with unintentional weight loss, in particular, cholinesterase inhibitors such as denipazil, and the diabetes drugs within the categories of SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 agonists. And last, alcohol and stimulant abuse are both associated with weight loss as well. Among U.S. adults, occult tumors, depression, and dementia are particularly common etiologies of unintentional weight loss. When evaluating a patient with weight loss, the first step is to quantify it, how much and over what duration, along with examining previous weight fluctuations and trends. There are four general patterns of weight loss which warrant different degrees of concern. There is the patient whose weight repeatedly goes up and down over the years, along with the patient who's had a very long stable baseline weight, followed by an uptrend, and then a downtrend back to that previous baseline. Both of these patterns are mildly concerning. That's not to say that you, shouldn't, that you should ignore them. On the contrary, you want to understand why your patient has been experiencing this, but they are relatively less likely to be indicative of a potentially life-threatening problem. The next most concerning pattern is the patient who has had a slow, gradual decline in weight stretching back several years. This is the kind of pattern one sees with dementia, COPD, and diseases associated with malabsorption. The most concerning pattern is the patient who has had a stable baseline weight for a while and then abruptly loses a lot of weight over a few months. This is the most common pattern in occult malignancy and also might be experienced by an individual with severe depression. Returning to the history, ask the patient about their oral intake and appetite and social considerations. For example, how do they purchase their food? Do they get it themselves or does someone buy it for them? Who cooks it? How many meals a day do they eat? And do they eat alone or with others? Ask about other associated symptoms, a non-exhaustive list of which includes nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, bloody or black bowel movements, fever, dyspnea, polyuria, and depressed mood. Take a complete medical, surgical, and psychiatric history, even more complete than you would for most other complaints. A medication and substance use history. Ask about HIV and TB risk factors, the former of which will require a sexual history. And go through a very thorough review of systems. Even a small, random detail, which the patient might not think is important, could point you towards a likely explanation. For example, changes in the character of their hair might point towards thyroid disease. Changes in vision could suggest undiagnosed diabetes, and clubbing of their fingers could be a sign of lung cancer. After the history comes the physical exam, and this is one of the uncommon chief symptoms for which a so-called complete physical exam is appropriate rather than a focused one. The clue to a diagnosis, it could be hiding anywhere. The most frequently overlooked components of the complete physical exam include a thorough lymph node exam, a mental status exam, and a dementia screen, and a depression screen. If the history and exam do not point to a specific cause, they should be followed by some key labs, including a CBC, basic metabolic panel, calcium, albumin, hemoglobin A1c, TSH, and an HIV screen. Other tests to consider include age-appropriate cancer screening and a chest x-ray or a chest CT 
if the patient has a significant smoking history. Although I think the yield is relatively low in the absence of a symptom, exam, or lab finding pointing specifically towards intra-abdominal pathology, some clinicians will order a CT abdomen and pelvis for everyone at this point. Other labs that can be considered include ESR, CRP, HCV screen, LFTs, PSA, and an LDH. The key takeaway points of this video. Clinically significant weight loss is variably defined, but often considered to be a loss of 5-10% to of body weight over the preceding 6-12 to 12 months. The probability of an identifiable cause requiring treatment increases with the quantity and with the speed of weight loss. Common etiologies of unexplained weight loss among U.S. adults are occult malignancy, depression, and dementia. A particularly thorough history and exam are the most important parts of the diagnostic workup. And last, other important parts of the workup include a CBC, metabolic panel, hemoglobin A1c, TSH, HIV screen, chest imaging, and age-appropriate cancer screening.